Welcome to the end of week 4. So, in this week we learnt about uh, protein folding and denaturation. In this week we learnt about the basics of uh, protein structure, we learnt about different um, the primary, secondary and tertiary structures of uh, protein. We learnt how these different uh, forms fold together to give a folded tertiary structure of a protein which is basically a folded shape of a protein. And we also learned that this particular shape is very important for its function. And finally, we talked about the experimental technique where we denatured a protein and that gave us a lot of information about how proteins fold. So, <coughs> proteins are linear polymers made of amino acids and this is the basic structure of an amino acid where this unit has two functional groups. One is the amine group and the other one is the acidic, the carboxylic group. It has also a hydrogen atom and this R is the side chain. So, there are 20 uh, amino acids in a natural protein and this R group is the one that is different between these 20 amino acids. The linear polymer of amino acids is formed by a condensation reaction where the carboxylic group of one amino, amino acid reacts with the amino group, amino group of another amino acid resulting in the formation of a peptide bond. So, this CONH group, this is the peptide bond. Now, this is a dipeptide, this free carboxylic group is free to react with the NH2 group of another amino acid and that will result in the formation of a tripeptide. So, that way this uh, peptide can keep on increasing in length resulting in a long linear protein. But that is just the chemical structure of the protein. Okay. This protein, this linear molecule spontaneously folds into a tertiary structure resulting in a particular shape of that protein and this particular shape of the protein is very important for its function. For example, enzymes have a particular shape. So, enzymes are natural catalysts which can speed up reactions to a very high degree and the capability of catalyzing reactions depends on the arrangement of the functional groups in its active site. And this active site is maintained in a particular shape by the tertiary structure of that enzyme. So, the tertiary structure of a protein is very important. We also learned about certain terms that are very useful in studying how proteins fold. So, we learned about the native state or the folded state of a protein. These two terms are used interchangeably and they mean essentially the same thing which is the final folded structure of a protein. This is the form in which the protein is functional. The other state of a protein is the denatured state or the unfolded state. So, in this state the protein exists as a linear or some random structure which is very different from this folded structure. So, that is why you see that several different chains have been drawn here just to show that many different forms are possible in the unfolded or the denatured state. So, this is like a unraveled ball of wool. So, here the ball of wool is tightly shaped and here it is unraveled so that you can have any structure uh, which is not very compact, not very tight and also this one is non-functional. So, we also learned that there are several interactions which stabilize the native or the folded state of a protein. The first one is hydrophobic interaction. So, this interaction happens between the hydrophobic or the non-polar groups for example, methyl groups or the aromatic groups in the side chain of aromatic amino acids. So, they want, they interact with each other, these are very bulky hydrophobic groups and they do not like to interact with the polar solvent that is water. So, they can interact with each other and these interaction, these groups are found at the core of the protein which is away from the polar solvent. The second type of interaction is ionic interaction. There, that is interaction between positive and negative charged groups. For example, the side chains of aspartic or glutamic acids are negatively charged and they can interact with the side chains of arginine and lysine which are positively charged. So, you can have ionic interactions between these side chains 
and these interactions are found on the surface of the protein because they do not have any problem to interact with the polar solvent. The third type of interaction which is also very important is the formation of hydrogen bond. So, this is a dipole-dipole interaction. A very good example is the hydrogen bond formation between NH groups and the CO groups. So, CO is the carbonyl group and NH is the amide group. So, they can form hydrogen bonds and stabilize the structure of a protein. These three interactions are all non-covalent interaction. One covalent interaction that is also seen frequently in proteins is the formation of disulfide bonds. But this is present only when there are 16 amino acids which have this site, uh, SH in the side chain and they can form a disulfide linkage if they are close enough to form a disulfide bond and that is a covalent bond and the formation of a disulfide bond can tremendously increase the stability of a protein. So, <coughs> before we go into the study of uh, uh, protein by denaturation that we saw in the lab class, last lab component of this week also, let me just reintroduce this idea of uh, thermodynamic hypothesis of protein folding because it is important to for us to understand why should we study protein denaturation because we know that the native or the folded protein is the one that is functionally important. Then why at all should we care about unfolding a protein or denaturing a protein. So, what is the thermodynamic hypothesis of protein folding? It states that the interactions between the atoms in a protein control the folding of the protein molecule into a well defined three dimensional structure. What does that mean? So, it means that the protein sequence, the primary sequence of amino acids contains enough information that is required to fold the protein into a three dimensional structure or shape. So, the final structure or shape of the protein is determined by the primary sequence of that protein. This is a very powerful and very important statement because what it means is that if I have the sequence of a protein and if I understand protein folding properly, I should be able to predict its final folded form. So, if I can predict its final folded form, I should also be able to predict its function. So, if you discover a new protein and if you determine its primary sequence, if you understand protein folding, you can immediately tell what will be its final folded form, what will be its structure and what will be its function. The converse also becomes true that if I want to design a protein with a particular function, I can come up with the structure that will be necessary to get that function and if I can get that structure, I can determine the primary sequence of a protein that will give that structure. So, if I need a particular function, I can design a protein that will have that function. Now, all of this can be done if we understand protein folding. So, that is why understanding protein folding is a very important goal of protein science. So, how do we study denatur denaturation of protein? There are several ways. We can denature a protein by the application of heat energy. So, that is thermal denaturation. You can increase the temperature of your protein, sol uh, protein solution and you can follow how it is denaturing. You can add various organic solvents that will disrupt the dielectric constant, that will disrupt the hydrophobic interactions and it will denature the protein. We can also change the pH, we can go at extreme pH to denature a protein. For example, if we drop the pH of uh, our protein solution to less than 2, then we know from our previous lectures that the electrostatic interactions will be hampered because aspartic acid, glutamic acid, their side chains have pK of more than 3. So, if I drop the pH to less than 2, then all these amino acid side chains will become neutral instead of negatively charged. So, the electrostatic interactions will be lost and if enough electrostatic interactions are lost, then a protein can de uh, denature or unfold. And finally, there are several chemical reagents which can be used to denature protein. 
a very good example is urea urea is something that interferes with the hydrogen bonding pattern of a protein it also interacts with uh, interferes with how the solvent the water molecules are arranged in around the protein so all these disruptions also lead to the unfolding of a protein molecule in the lab component of this week we looked at denaturation of the human serum albumin so it's a protein and we just followed this one particular protein and we looked at its denaturation by several methods so we used urea and guanidium chloride these are the two chemical denaturation denaturants and we also used heat to denature this protein and so that is the reagent that was used to unfold the protein and how did we observe so we used two different techniques one was uv visible spectra and the other one was the tryptophan fluorescence so i will not go through all of these examples i will just go through one and i will try to explain how once you have done the experiment how you will look at the data and get some meaningful information out of this experiment so i will talk about the de heat denaturation of the human serum albumin and its observation by uv visible spectroscopy <coughs> so thermal denaturation of hsa studied by the uv visible absorbance so we saw pritham discuss this uh, in details in the lab and what he did was he used five different temperatures 25 degree centigrade 37 degree centigrade 45 60 and 80 so he heated these the protein sample at these five different temperatures and he collected the uv visible spectra in the range of 200 to 400 nanometer this particular range was selected because beyond 400 nanometer there was no not much uh, signal it was mostly noise so he selected this range which was good enough for this particular experiment so what we saw so uh, the spectra for these under these five different conditions are are plotted here and for our further analysis what we will do is we will only look at the absorbance at a280 because at a280 we sort of got the maxima for this particular curve so at 25 and 37 there was not much difference you can see that these are two different lines if you follow it up here and you can see there are two lines okay so there was not much change between 25 and 37 and then it changed a lot at 45 then there was again some change at 60 and finally there was a lot of change at 80 since this was just a demonstration we followed uh, the denaturation of this protein by only at only five different points but if you are doing a very meticulous experiment you will have to collect much more data points so for a detailed experiment you will have to collect data at 5 degree intervals between 20 to 45 degree centigrade between 45 to 65 you have to collect spectrum at every 1 degree interval and again between 65 to 90 you can collect spectrum at every 5 degree interval the reason that we collect spectrum at every 1 degree interval is that for most proteins the thermal denaturation happens between in this range so we want as much data point as possible in this most interesting region so this is a typical curve that you will see if we perform an experiment like this so what we have done is you will collect data you will collect spectrum for each temperature between 200 to 400 nanometer and you will get a sp get spectra like this but you will follow the absorbance only at one particular point in this case it is at 280 nanometers so what i have done is i have taken only the absorbance at 280 nanometers and i have plotted this okay so if i do an experiment like this and if i look at only the absorbance at 280 nanometers and if i plot it versus the temperature it would look something like this now it is very important to note so we can draw a curve through that now it is very important to note 
that the absorbance at each point is contributed by these two different states of the protein. So, the protein exists in two states either it is in the native state or it is in the denatured state. Okay. We do not know how much of it is contributed by the native state and how much of it is contributed by the denatured state. That is something that we need to figure out from this curve. So, before we do that what you will also observe is that initially there is increase in the absorbance with temperature then suddenly there is a jump and then there is again sort of a linear increase in the absorbance. So, linear means it is increasing in a straight line. So, it is increasing in a straight line here and it is increasing in a straight line here. So, this is just the dependence of the absorbance A to A T on temperature. So, it turns out that even though the protein is folded the absorbance can change with temperature and again similarly even the protein is unfolded the absorbance will depend on the temperature and it can if it increases linearly we can actually fit these few data points and these few data points to two straight lines. So, that is the first thing that we need to do. So, we can fit these few data points to a straight line and we will get a straight line equation for the dependence of the absorbance of the native state on temperature. So, there is a straight line equation where this A n is the absorbance of the native state, this is the slope of the line and this is the y intercept of the line and this T is the temperature of each of these points. So, once we determine m and c we know how the absorbance of the native state depends on temperature and we can calculate the absorbance of the native state at any temperature. Similarly, if we fit these few points to a straight line we will get the dependence of the absorbance of the denatured state on temperature. So, here again we have two other two constants this is the slope and this is the y intercept and we have to determine these two constants and then we will know the dependence of the absorbance of the denatured state on the temperature. Once we have these two equations we solve these two equations we can determine the fraction of the denatured state present at any of these points. So, how do we do that? We use this particular equation this A is absorbance at any temperature suppose we are looking at the absorbance at this temperature. Okay. So, at this temperature we know the actual absorbance value we will subtract this absorbance value from the absorbance of the native state. So, how will we get the absorbance of the native state we have this straight line equation. So, this straight line will have an absorbance somewhere here. So, we subtract this absorbance value from this absorbance value and then in the denominator we subtract the same absorbance of the native state from the absorbance of the denatured state. So, what is the absorbance of the denatured state that will be somewhere here. So, the absorbance of the denatured state will be somewhere here. So, we subtract the absorbance of the native state from the absorbance of the denatured state and that goes in the denominator. So, what we will get is a ratio and this will be something less than 1 and that ratio gives us what fraction of these total molecules is present in the denatured state. Okay. So, for each of these points that we have collected data we can calculate this F d and we can plot that versus the temperature and if we do that it will look something like this. So, F d is plotted in the y axis and that gives us the fraction of the denatured state present. So, in the initial stages where the temperature is low the protein is mostly folded or it is in the native state. So, you will see that this fraction F d will be almost close to 0. Okay. As the temperature increases it slowly keeps on increasing then suddenly there is a jump and then at higher temperatures almost all of the protein is unfolded because now the fraction denatured is almost 1. So, this is a typical 
curve that you will see. And one of the most important parameters that we determine from a curve like this is the temperature at which Fd is 0.5. So, it means that at this temperature 50 percent of the protein is in native state and 50 percent of the protein is in the denatured state. And this particular temperature is called the melting temperature and it is represented by Tm. So, melting temperature is the temperature at which a particular protein exists in 50 percent native and 50 percent denatured state. So, this Tm is a very important parameter that is used to characterize a protein because if the melting temperature of a protein is high, then that protein is a very stable protein and if the melting temperature of a protein is low, then that protein is a unstable protein. So, melting temperature of a protein gives us a very good idea about the stability of a particular protein. So, what we have done so far? We took the raw data, we followed the absorbance at a particular value and plotted it as a function of temperature. Then we fit the two extremes to two straight lines to determine the dependence of the absorbance for the native state and the denatured state on temperature. And then we calculated this fraction of denatured state present at each temperature and plotted that and from that we determined the melting temperature. So, the same principle can be used for any denaturation studies. For example, if we are using urea instead of temperature here, it will be urea. So, you will follow the absorbance of your protein under varying concentration of urea. Okay. So, <coughs> this will be a very general plot of all the experiments that were shown in the lab. So, the ultimate goal is to determine this fractional denaturation and you plot that versus temperature or the concentration of urea or the concentration of vanadium hydrochloride. This fractional, fractional denaturation is calculated from the observable, observable uh, parameter that we use. So, it can be absorbance, it can be fluorescence, it can be circular dichroism, it can be anything. So, we, we will use that and from that we will calculate the fractional denaturation. And then when you plot this at 0.5 is the you get the value where the so, if it is temperature, you will get the melting temperature. Okay. So, once we have that from that, we can go on to calculate the free energy of the protein. We can calculate the enthalpy and entropy of the folded state of the protein, so on and so forth. So, that is all for this week. Thank you.